So we've already figured out that most hams uh, in the late 50s and early 60s and even into the late 60s uh, preferred to buy a simple kit radio or a uh, ready-made radio that was uh, within their realm of possibility of uh, their paper route or some other way of making money. And uh, of course this Heathkit AR3 represents some of those novice type uh, receivers that maybe uh, were obtainable. But the transmitter is another story. Normally the transmitter was something that your Elmer helped you with and uh, basically it would be a one or a two tube type transmitter and maybe you would construct that along with your Elmer hoping to learn something. Well I've got a couple transmitters I want to show you that might have been paired with that receiver like this uh, for that uh, young novice starting out. And uh, we just had our Nearfest Spring Edition. Uh, this is a local ham fest here in New England. Very popular for boat anchors. And I happened to grab a fantastic early 60s handbook style transmitter that I want to show off to you guys. I have shown this off before. This is a classic 6AG7, 6L6, Master Oscillator, Power Amplifier, MOPA, Crystal Controlled Oscillator, driving a Class C final. And uh, you'll find these uh, schematics all over the old handbooks and magazines from the 30s, 40s, and 50s and uh, certainly on the internet in force. Um, but I was at a ham fest and I found a transmitter that I immediately recognized shoved way to the front of a truck. He hadn't even unloaded it yet and it was well into the day. He, I guess he didn't even want to bother to bring it out but I spotted something that I recognized. So let me get it up on the table so we can see what it is. So does anybody recognize what this is just looking at the back of it? Um, this is actually the transmitter that I built uh, when I was a novice. Uh, for 80 meters I had an ARC-5, but for um, operation on 40 meters and 15 meters I had obtained a, a copy of the Radio Amateur's Handbook and pretty much all the handbooks from about, I don't know, 1960 through maybe 66 or so. They had a circuit in there, and it was uh, a three-band oscillator transmitter for the novice. And it was like a deja vu moment. I recognized the back of this transmitter, probably from this picture right here. So looking at this radio compared to the picture, it's virtually identical. I mean completely identical. Um, someone has built the transmitter as described exactly in the handbook. This is a single tube oscillator using a 6DQ6 and it has a uh, an OD3 VR150 regulator tube and it's built right to print so to speak. Now the front panel doesn't look exactly like the front panel here in a completely enclosed box. But if we turn it around I think we can see that it basically has all of the items in the right spot. Hope you can see this. Okay. It's got the meter in the right position. You know, it's got the, uh, the oscillator and the final tuning and loading in the right position, the crystal in the right position, and the key jack in the right position. So we've hit the nail on the head. So the guy says, well, just give me $10 and take it away. So let me clean this up, and we will see if we can get this classic ARRL handbook transmitter back on the air. So a novice transmitter, and a, uh, a very nice one that was extremely popular because uh, I have a 1957 radio amateur handbook that includes it and I have a 1965 which includes it so uh, this particular design it was so successful that they carried it in the ARRL handbook for many many years. Now one of the uh, 
the very positive things about this transmitter. As you can see here, it has an onboard power supply. Uh, this transformer and uh, this tube were items that uh, you could find in the television sets of the day. So there's a couple very important parts that could come right out of a TV. The final tube, the 6DQ6, was also a popular TV horizontal output amplifier. So uh, this, uh, this brought the part costs down dramatically because three of the major parts, these two tubes and this transformer, could be recovered uh, from an old TV set. The same can be said about the two variable capacitors. These are things that you could find in common uh, AM table radios. So uh, this is uh, important in reducing uh, the parts cost for the novice. Um, in the example that I found at the ham flea market, uh, it looks like they actually ordered the parts and uh, other than the meter being a different model, it's almost identical to what was shown in the handbook. So here's the original uh, article as shown in the handbook. And notice that the novice transmitter is in a shielded enclosure. This is very important from the standpoint of television interference or TVI. Uh, TVI was the, uh, the bane of the novice operator and the ham operator in the late 50s and early 60s because most people received TV over the air and uh, any harmonics that you put out or even a very strong unshielded signal uh, could get into the television set and you'd have a knock on the door or a telephone call from your neighbor tell that kid to get off the air he's interfering with my TV so uh, hence the uh, the need for shielding. Okay, here we have the schematic and the parts list of uh, this little oscillator transmitter. Now this is a single tube transmitter made popular in the 40s and 50s uh, with uh, tubes like the 6L6 and the 6V6. Uh, the 6DQ6 as an oscillator was a new idea and a power oscillator at that. So what kind of power can you run with a single tube type transmitter like this? They're running it at about 30 watts input power. 30 watts input power from the power supply. Uh, now an oscillator doesn't have great efficiency, uh, but we could expect with 30 watts of input power that here at the output we might get between 10 and 15 watts out. So that's what we're looking for for power output from our oscillator transmitter. Notice also that it is a three-band transmitter. Uh, 80 meters, 40 meters, and 15 meters were the only frequencies that were allowed or allocated to novices during this time. They also had to use crystal control. So this is a crystal control transmitter. To improve uh, the possibility of a clean signal, they included a VR150 regulation tube. Uh, the voltage regulator tube puts a steady 150 volts on the screen of the oscillator. Uh, and when you're keying the cathode, as we are here, um, you should get a clean sounding CW note, or at least clean enough for a novice. One other uh, feature that they added to this transmitter was a simple relaxation oscillator using an NE2 neon bulb. This allowed you to do code practice or monitor your own signal uh, while you're keying the transmitter. So you can send the signal over to the receiver's audio amplifier and it will come out the speaker of the receiver. Therefore, you had side tone keying capability with the transmitter. So the power supply is very simple. It's a full wave. Uh, diode, two diode type system um, uh, regulated only by the VR tube. The high voltage, the 370 volts, is put on the plate and the 150 volts is on the screen. Uh, this uh, topology for the oscillator, you might recognize it, it is a coal pits, an electron coupled 
coal pits oscillator. Here we have a parasitic choke arrangement, again to reduce the possibility of high frequency spurious emissions that would interfere with TV. A conventional pi output uh, with an added capacitor at the lowest band, 80 meters, and a choke on the output uh, for safety should uh, there be a failure of this capacitor, high voltage would be presented to the output, it would be shorted by this choke, and that consequently should blow the fuse. So let's look for the fuse. Does anybody see a fuse? I don't see a fuse. This is an error in the schematic. We should be adding a fuse and it should be in line before these capacitors. It could be either placed here or before the switch. So we can always find fault with any schematic. There's always room for improvements. So again, take a look at this parts list. It's pretty standard. Um, again, this was a very successful design. Um, I have one other fault to identify with this transmitter that some of you know about. It's called crystal current. Uh, oscillators are known to uh, put current through their crystals and if that current is high enough it can actually overheat the crystal and cause it to crack. Um, in uh, some cases you could put a bulb uh, right in series with the crystal. You would look at the brightness of the bulb and if it got too bright uh, you could adjust C1 or your tuning control C6 and try not to have as much current going into the crystal. This is very apparent when you are mistuned you might accidentally put too much current through the crystals. Now you might also be asking about well where can I find crystals today? Uh, well you can find them online because people are building crystals again and buying them in great quantities so that inexpensive uh, crystals can be had. The problem with these however is in an oscillator like this you would probably crack them even easier than the old FT243 crystals that we used to use back in the day. So what people are doing is they're putting uh, maybe 100 ohm quarter watt resistors in series with the crystal and putting the entire assembly in an old FT243 crystal holder. The resistor acts to limit the current through the crystal. We're going to try that with this transmitter to see if we can get the transmitter to work with modern crystals without cracking them. So here we are, the modern single tube novice transmitter, crystal controlled, bringing it up slowly after we've uh, restored the circuit and uh, cleaned it up. We'll be testing this thing out and seeing how it operates on the air. So in looking at the quality of the workmanship, uh, the use of rivets, and the expert soldering inside this uh, novice transmitter. It's very apparent that a very senior uh, Elmer type ham with lots of technician skills assembled this and uh, it's amazing the amount of uh, care and work that went into this assembly. Okay I've used some Neverdoll on the chassis to shine it up a little bit. So I put a coat of uh, flat black on the power transformer. I did that in place by uh, screening off the sections I didn't want to get paint on. I did remove the choke and put a coat of paint on that. Um, I noticed there's no grommet here. I'm going to add a grommet uh, for the uh, choke leads going down because that's high voltage. Uh, the Neverdoll did shine up the chassis a little bit so it looks a little bit better. Uh, she got a complete bath. I removed as many parts as I could and uh, anything I thought that was sensitive like the meter I removed and uh, it cleaned up just fine. So I noticed that on a couple of the tubes the guide pins were removed. Well this might represent tubes that are castaways from a TV shop. They can't be used in a set but they're still perfectly good. Maybe good enough for a ham project. Really interesting. I've never seen a project with two of the guide pins removed. Sometimes people would do that if they would miswire the sockets because you can move a tube to the left or right around the socket if you happen to miswire it. But I've never seen it done purposely. Um, 
except to uh, disable the tube. But as you can see, the, the, uh, the glass parts of the tube are still intact. There's no gas showing in these tubes, and I'll bet they work just fine. I am not going to go any further with this first video. Uh, we've gone through the circuit. We've cleaned it up a little bit. In the next video, I'm going to actually make sure the wiring is all okay. We'll check the tubes, and we'll see if we can get this thing on the air.